Okay, um, welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ian Wu, artist, educator, uh, uh, program leader at LaSalle Fine, uh, College of Fine Arts, College of Arts, uh, and also program leader for the MA Fine Arts. As this, as this symposium is being co-hosted by the University of Melbourne, which is situated on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and would also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. All right, I, I end my acknowledgement here and uh, want to continue uh, with my introduction to uh, our second keynote for today's symposium. So as we move from uh, Claire Bishop's um, highly charged uh, uh, images and, and, and texts on uh, kind of political aesthetics uh, of uh, subversion uh, and negotiation. Um, we would like to slowly move now to a different space with uh, an, an artist from Cambodia. Um, perhaps even a kind of softer space where um, the idea of the personal, the idea of um, a kind of emptying out and a reconstructing of uh, forms that are inspired by memory and nature takes place. Um, I'm going to take this time to also to read uh, from uh, Sopip uh, Pitch uh, biography. So Sopip Pitch is born 1971. Batambang, Cambodia. At the end of the Khmer Rouge reign in 1979, Sopip's family left Cambodia as refugees. Having first settled in camps in Thailand and the Philippines, they arrived in the United States in 1984. He was 13 years old and began his formal education. He took art classes in junior high school, but shifted his passion to woodshop in high school and worked as a stagehand in college. He first majored in pre-med to satisfy his father's wish, but later switched to fine arts in his sophomore year, a choice that allowed him to travel to France, Italy, and Mexico, and led him to spend a year in Paris studying at the National Art School at Sergi Pontois. Forgive me if I, I pronounce it wrongly. These travels uh, impacted his views of the possibilities and limitations of art that have guided his thinking since. He returned to Cambodia in 2002 and in 2004 began making sculptures using rattan and bamboo, his main materials to this day. Aside from working on his art, he also owns a farm in the, in the Kirirom mountain areas where he plants hardwood trees, coconuts and date palms. Thematically, his overarching preoccupation is memory, nature, and process. He sees his works as results of his fascination and investigation of nature. He relies on intuition in making works that are at times organic, while, while other times geometric, and referencing paintings while always resonating with his environment and history. His work has been shown at Documenta 13, the Venice Benale, the Asia Pacific Trenale, among others. Major museum collections of Sopip's works include the Metropolitan, the Guggenheim, the National Gallery of Singapore, and the Centre Pompidou in Paris, among others. So, without further ado, uh, this talk uh, is Sopip will present for 45 minutes, followed by a 15 minute QA. And the QA will be using a um, Q and A uh, box that you, uh, we will be able to uh, we will be able to take out some of the questions for Sopip. So without further ado, uh, welcome, Sopip. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, thank you very much uh, to um, Adeline and uh, the three universities that invite me to be the keynote. It was a frankly a, a strange surprise. <laughs> Um, as you know, I'm 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 so far from sort of the real events of the world. It seems you know, living here in, in uh, Cambodia and um, Cambodia being kind of um, 
I want to say the exam, but we are not in, uh, kind of uh, uh, affected by the current situation, the global pandemic right now. Um, so in, 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 in that sense also, it, it mirrors the way that also I make my work and, um, but you know, the, the, the sense is there, the, the, the this quiet uh, feeling um, that I have every day is, is there. Um, as I, I live in the US for, in my formative years and my education, my school days, uh, years, my family is still there. But um, also, you know, uh, Hearing uh, uh, Claire Bishop's uh, uh, keynote this uh, morning for me uh, was also a kind of a wake up call in terms of what really is uh, going on. And, um, and that uh, for the rest of the three, two, three hours after that, I, 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 I reflect on that a little bit. Um, having said that, um, my title of my uh, note is a uh, keynote is called from the forest to the studio and I would like to communicate as best I can in the next you know 40 minutes an hour that we have um, and get you to see really what what and how you know what I make and, and how and how I live and, and, and what kind of work that I do in, in order to quiet a lot of things that um, that is uh, disquiet in in my life and in, in the world in general. Um, as Ian had said, I came back to uh, Cambodia in 2002, a country of my birth, a country that I think about every single day of my life when I was away. Um, what drove me back uh, was the need to actually find uh, my spiritual uh, roots um, and to, to, to find out if I'm really making this as a, a way of only to escape or a way to uh, perhaps express or, or give voice to um, how a person like me uh, can live and can 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 share a small contribution, whether that be uh, some kind of philosophical understanding or or bridging uh, my country, the country I lived in and dream about and 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 love, to uh, a kind of um, other, which is to say, the West or 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 what I'm used to for almost 20 years, you know, being in the US. Coming back uh, right away, you know, being that I was about 30 years old and uh, really had a lot of doubts about my ability um, because I think starting school at, 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 at in my teenage years and then graduating with a master degree in painting, uh, one can say that that is not really uh, in the handbook of how to uh, how to be a, an adult as a as a former refugee. So I'll go on to the slides. Um, I'm sorry, it's not there. We go. Um, my first sculpture in 2004 is called Silence. And now this is my very first sculpture in my life. I've never touched anything sculptural. I did admire sculptors, but it was never me to, 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 to claim that I know how to sculpt or even was interested in so much in sculpture because I was always thought of myself as a painter. I was the creator of images and I was influenced by beautiful paintings. Um, but this was a sculpture that I, accidentally accidentally made because of the need to to be physically involved in, in my process and to to play to find play and um and uh, stop thinking about what do i want to convey and and what do i want to express when i did this with rattan and wire and simple tools like knives and, and axes and chopping board 
it really brought me back to when I was a child. And I knew I was on a trip somewhere. So I go to the second sculpture, sorry, second sculpture, which is called Cycle. This is to reassure myself that what I'm doing is, is, is really, really making me feel or trusting that, I, that I'm feeling something real for the first time. And this is called Cycle and it's, it's uh, based on uh, one stomach and then it turned out to be a pair of stomach because I thought that one stomach had to be connected to a, not a pair of stomach. So this work was very, uh, uh, very important in my career. Later on, um, oh, and, and this work also teach me something about discipline and trust. Trust, I mean, and trust in that you're gonna do something and you're gonna do it until you get to the end and you'll judge it after it shows itself. And I've learned a lot from this sculpture. Fast forward to many years, several years later, a first sculpture of the flower I did called Morning Glory. Now in Morning Glory, if you read uh, into it, there's a lot of stories about it. But for me, Morning Glory is an essential food source when I was a child in, in growing up in Cambodia. And I had to make this sculpture because I feel like I want to make something beautiful Yet I'm, I'm, I'm living in a not a beautiful place. I'm living in a confusion. I'm living in, a, in a, a kind of limitation. But I really want to make something beautiful. So I chose this sculpture and I, I chose to make this flower. And I started to make the flower first. And this is how it got very big. And then I, I said, okay, I just, I'm just going to continue. And um, several months later, this is the product. And I subsequently made many smaller works um, related to this. And I look at more of the morning gl glory, glory flower in, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in nature, just around my house, around my garden, around the studio, and um, con continue to learn different things about it. It's almost like looking at it as a still life, doing many drawings, doing many sketchings, but really just absorbing you know, what it is that I'm gravitating to about it at that time. Another flower that became an interesting point to me, and you know, at, at some point I said to myself, this experience of making flowers as a contemporary artist, I think this is something that could be interesting. I mean, it could be a cliche, you know, like I, if I were a painter, I would never paint giant flowers. But I think as a sculptor, I thought maybe it's, give it a shot, why not? Because it's gonna take me about three or four months to do something of this scale. And I was hoping that in the process of doing that, that I would learn something. Maybe not art, but just something deeper and essential. Like someone said to me one time, hey Supia, if you just have a string or a piece of charcoal, you can make art. And that was a kind of a, that was a kind of lesson, you know, like, it, it stuck in my mind. It wasn't my teacher who says it. It was just somebody I know, just as my, my friend, who was not an artist. But I carry that. I carry that uh, thinking. And then subsequently, I make more of this in a smaller version and different variations of them. And uh, also at this time, you know, I I I, I kind of grown to accept that. You know, art, art is not an easy, uh, like if I want to say something, then I therefore go out and do it and express it and, and put it up and hope for, you know, someone will show it or something like that. You know, for me, making a sculpture has always been, I'm trying to do something to show myself something. To, to, to see, first of all, if I know how to do it. And secondly, if it does have any feeling, because that's what it's about. It's about emotion for me. You know, art for me is about like a, if I'm a musician, like a, I would make music because, because it makes me cry, you know? Like I listen to the kind of music that makes me imagine, you know? Um, and it's something that when it, when, when, when it comes to the end, it's like, oh, you know what? I can't do that. 
I can't sing and I can't, I, and I can't play the guitar, but that's what I listen for. Um, and so at this point, I, I began to think more about technical things and uh, technical things, um, um, mark making, um, um, what is the resonance, you know? Like uh, when, you see a, when you see a drawing or when you see a painting, what is it about that painting that grabs you, you know? And I was always a fan of, of artwork that grabs me, you know? So, so like the first, the first painting that was not mine, th that I didn't think of it from, from, my, from my head was I had to make a copy of a Van Gogh. And, but it wasn't a Van Gogh. I mean, I didn't know it was a Van Gogh. You know, like years later, it turned out to be a Van Gogh. It was like a shoe surprise to me. Like when I was in college, I realized, oh, I did a copy of Van Gogh when I was in junior high school. And the reason for that is because I, 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 I love the lines. I think the lines is where the, the, is where the blood is, you know? It's where, the, it's where the pain is. Where the search, where the adventure, the discovery, it's all in the lines for me. And so it's not surprising that I'm a huge fan of uh, Giacometti and I'm a huge fan, I'm a huge fan of uh, uh, Francuzzi, you know? Because I've seen those people's work in, in museums, in real life, and even just seeing it in a, in a catalog. It, it just, you know, I'm just forever gravitate towards these kind of artists. So, I started to make these uh, drawings out of bamboo sticks uh, in 2016. Well, I started before that, but it, it matured in 2016. And I discovered certain things like you can turn it upside down and you can lift your hand this way and that way. You can you can put it in the, you know, you can hang it in the air for a few minutes and it all behaves differently in the way the ink flow and all of that kind of stuff. Just experimenting and just playing and, and kind of being caught up in this sort of little bubble. And then, yeah, I kind of uh, said, okay, this bubble needs to go somewhere. I need to just push the bubble further. So it got bigger and bigger. So it got to almost uh, two meters high. And I made a series of work of this size. And I use a natural, uh, natural pigment. See, I'm, I'm a big fan of natural things just because I, you know, in, in, my, in my, really in my honest self, I really don't know anything about color. I just trust that if I choose natural color and just make it show itself a certain way, put it together in a certain way, like, like it's gonna be substantial enough. So most of the work that I do it's just natural color. Like this is a work that goes back a year or two, and it's um, just raw bamboo and uh, black bamboo, which is not the black bamboo. It's actually the torching of the bamboo that I learned from the technique of bending the rattan to make these sort of giant organic or geometric sculptures. I learned that when you tor you have to torch it to bend it so it doesn't break, and then I learned that when you torch something, it turns dark. So I thought, you know what? That's charcoal. That's one color. Let's mix that with the raw color. And I, you know, there are different configurations, like, okay, I'm giving myself this parameter. There's a certain distance you can run. How slow can you run in this very short space? So in that slowness, and trust me, the way I work, the way this kind of work happened is very slow. But if it were a drawing or a painting, you could say maybe it can be done very quickly. But when you have to build it one strand, little strand at a time and how it connects and all these little simple little details, uh, then it becomes very, very slow and time consuming. It, it takes endurance. But I, you know, I, I continue to explore new things. See, I'm, a, I'm a kind of a circular, I'm a kind of circular artist. I'm not a, I'm not a like a vertical kind of artist. I, I think I'm, I'm more like, uh, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a swimmer, you know, I just go horizontal and I kind of take things along and then I, I leave them alone and then I, I combine it again, I pick it up again. And so, you know, I collect old wood and it turns that I also in love with the mark making on the old wood, the mark making thing that I did not do. These are old wood from the sixties, from the fifties, that I get from you know people who throw them away or antique shops that you know just really made for just a few people that are interested in these kind of things. 
And then I learned how to combine the rattan and the bamboo and, you know, cow skin, cow hide, that kind of thing. You know, looking at it like a, like a painting again. Um, black, like this period, I mean, this is a, you know, I'm skipping, you know, I'm going back and forth. So my, as you see, I, I, uh, my work kind of go in circle like this. This is in 2012, uh, black. I used black for the first time because my teacher always says, never use black in your painting, you know? Black takes over and you don't want to do that because, you know, you have to leave room for other colors. So I, I thought, you know what, I'm going to use black. But the black that I use is charcoal. It's charcoal that I grind up and I mix it with beef. And so this is around two meter, yeah, two meters square. Burlap and the color, the little color that you see there are just the stitching in the burlap because they're used. These are used burlap that I was collecting for many years before but never knew what to do, never know what to do with them. And finally I said, oh, I need a, I need a surface in order to, to, to put some, some color, some pigment, some material on. And then uh, that presented itself like, oh, here I am, use me. And then it turned, you know, like, oh, I'm using black. So what about if I just use the, just the raw, uh, the raw uh, uh, burlap itself and let that be shown. So I made many works also with just raw burlap with nothing on it, just raw burlap. And just, I, I glue it onto the, to the grids. So, you know, I, I don't claim to be uh, an abstract expressionist or, or to, to, to say that, uh, you know, I, I discover anything new, but it's just a way for me to, hey, you've got to do something, you know, wake up and do something. So just, just do, just keep doing it, you know? So it's more like, a, more like a, someone who punch in and out, you know, when they go to work, which, which I truly believe in that that's, that is what saved me, you know? Just, just go to work every day. And then of course, I, I love nature, always been, always grow up in nature. Um, and uh, I need not go into too far into the past, but in the present, I plant a lot of trees and I, I love the, looking at the, the way the, the, the shoots of the bamboo, you know, grow. And I love how the new leaves and grow and I love different flowers and different seeds and, and whatnot. So this is a rosewood seed. And someone, one of my assistants actually went to his uh, house uh, for one of these uh, New Year uh, break and, 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 and stuff like that. And he brought me the one seed and, uh, and he said, look at this bomb. This is so nice, you know, could be interesting. And I looked at it and I said, yeah, this is really nice. Let's, let's think about it, do something. So I've also been collecting a lot of stone. Uh, and the stone that I collect are the cheapest stone because I cannot afford the, 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 the marble, you know. I always wanted marble, but first of all, it doesn't really, we don't have Carrera marble here. We don't have beautiful marble, like the way, like that look like milk, you know, like I would love to have that, but we don't have it. So I, I think, okay, let's think of it just as rocks and collecting old rocks and rocks that are, you can get it for really cheap or, or free or, or just pick up on the side of the road. So I started to make these small, small work. Then I thought, you know, maybe I should make a bigger work. Back to the burlap and uh, the bamboo again, and the chalk and the, and the torching to give it texture. And then a couple of years ago, yeah, a few years ago, I decided to, hey, you know, this seed idea is pretty interesting, I think, but you really got to take it more seriously. I mean, you really have to throw yourself in there. So I said, all right, let's try. Let's try one make the biggest one possible, two, make it from the smallest strand bamboo possible and see if it holds up. So, you know, a lot of people ask me, do you have a mold? Do you have like a, like a, like a, like a fiberglass mold or plastic mold or some kind of mold and then you, you wrap your bamboo on it or, no, 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 we, we build it out of, out of air. It's, it's really just anchoring stuff, strings and ropes and, you know, sticks. Um, but this is a, this is the size of a shipping container, this seed. And I wanted to make a, see the problem with the seed is that I don't want it to separate them, right? So I can make them bigger, but then I would have to make them in pieces. And no, I want something whole. I really want to have something like a whole 
experiences with no mitigation. It's really just the essential part. So no question about it. Like, not about that, hey, how do you put that together? But more like, how did you make that, right? So, so actually this, this seed part does not fit for a vertical into a container, it fits diagonal. So it takes all the space and just snug it in there. And that was, I have to say that was pretty, pretty cool how that just kind of fit in there without having to bend it and all that. So, so we estimated the, the size correctly. This is a, another seed pot. This is from Singapore. Uh, I spent a little bit of time, or a lot of time in Singapore because my wife, my beautiful wife live in Singapore. And I go and, and see her and we walk around. And, um, and this is happened to be just some seed pot that uh, uh, was just laying around in a, in, a, in a park. We go to a lot of parks. There's never been one trip that we didn't go to a park together. And so I collect these things and I thought, this is really interesting. It's split open differently and when it ages, as you see the one on the left, it's kind of old and, uh, you know, scarred and, and dried and so it behaved differently. So I collected a bunch of them. And I started making small sculptures of them. Then I thought I'd make a big one too, why not? But this, I want to make an open one, right? So, so the question is, how do you make something open like this and be able to stand up? And, uh, you know, I can stand in, in, inside of this pod without having to bend over, like without having to, to crouch. So, and this, this idea of scale is very important to me. And I think maybe it has something to do with the fact that I'm, I'm Cambodian or Cambodian and we are quite invisible. You know, we are the invisible Southeast Asian country, you know. Uh, uh, you know, we have Angkor Wat and that's sort of our namesake. That was, that's our symbol. But as far as the Cambodian people and what we, what we do outside of that, what, what we did in centuries ago, we are pretty invisible. So maybe it's, it's, it's that idea too in me, you know, to, to hey, Sophia, come on. If you're gonna do this, let's do it to the best and the biggest you can, all right? So there's something about that aside from, of course, the, the testing yourself, whether, you know, technically you can do it and, your assistant can do it and all that stuff. And we made another one. And I go back again. This is Bain. This is uh, the first, uh, the, that, that, that giant seed pot that fit into a container. I realize also that this seed pot is also interesting. So I use this form and I just, I said to myself, you know, let's do something a little different. Use some of that wood that you collected torch into it, draw onto it, make this one solid, make this one whole, make this one raw, combine it together. Yeah, this one is called diet from last year. And from there, there's a conversation in my head and I say, let's make another one. And this is the result of it. The, left, the right hand side is a cowhide. And the cowhide thing is interesting because I've been collecting cowhide as well. Because the cow hide uh, uh, in the temples, they make uh, these beautiful sounding drums. And in Siem Reap, I, I witnessed uh, people who actually make these things. They have to stretch the cow hide for, you know, for weeks in the sun and they scrape it and they wash it, they scrape it. And all sorts of mu musical instruments you know, are made with, uh, with animal hide, and snake skin, cow skin, goat skin. So I just begin to collect them just in case you know, I always believe like if you, if you have enough material around you, at some point those materials are gonna tell you what to do, or at least suggest to you, su suggest to you like what is their function? Why are you attracted to them in the first place? And uh, I go back in time a little bit uh, with this material idea, because it's all about the material for me. It's the expression of the material, but I'm not daring enough as to say, well, I'm just gonna put this in the middle of the floor and call it art. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, I guess maybe I'm just not mature enough to, to do that. So I'm still in this sort of, I'm still in this stage in my life where it's like, you know, do something, make it, make it with your body, make it with your hand, more so than with your, with your head, you know? So make it with your heart, make it with your body, make it with your weakness, make it with your strength. And then 
yeah, let's see what that form, let's see what it is. So it took many, many iterations before this become a sculpture and it took like years before it arrived at this point. I made many bad sculptures before I get here, but I won't bore you with those. And here's another uh, angle from it. Now I combine this sculpture with uh, those uh, linear uh, vertical drawings that you saw earlier, some of them I think you saw earlier, earlier uh, at the Venice Biennale. And uh, I think it would be walked by it and have no clue what they were about, but you know, that's okay. <sighs> Take a little breath here. So as uh, Ian was also uh, saying in my introduction uh, that I own a farm, uh, I bought, well not bought, I, I actually exchanged a, a piece of land with a, with a couple of my sculpture from a doctor who was a collector of mine and someone in Cambodia, you know, rare and far in between um, that actually collects art and, uh, and really have a lot of my work and want to own more before he moved back to Germany. And he, uh, he said, I bought this land 10 years ago. Uh, I either sell it or I can give it to you. So I said, all right, we'll trade it for a couple of sculptures. So from this land, I explore more land and uh, a little background on Carey Room. Carey Room is a, a place uh, about two, three and a half, two or two and a half hour from south from Phnom Penh, from the capital city of Cambodia. Uh, and it's between Sien Will, which is uh, the Cambodian colleague on Pong Saum, which is the coast. And uh, so it's halfway between the coast and the capital city. And it's a straight line. But the road there is quite atrocious. I mean, it's paved, but it's really, it's two lane most of the time. And it's very dangerous. So property here, yeah, five, six years, seven years ago, very cheap. So I took the opportunity asking the villagers, hey, come on, you know, do you have anything? Do you know anybody? So I end up, purchasing more land. I purchased a big plot of land surrounded by mountain with a river that I have to cross for the first time. So we had to build a bridge, which was very interesting, you know, working to build a bridge in this rural community known for rice paddies and uh, mango plantations, you know, and uh, a bit off the far end of the village nobody really get there unless you know where to go. So it's, this is my staff and uh, we do a lot of, uh, so we planted, we planted coconut. You know, I thought, you know what, let's plant coconut just because I want to. I don't want to plant uh, uh, what everybody else is plant and um, which is mango. Everybody is always about the mango. You plant mango, you cannot lose money. Yeah, I think they're right. but. Well, I planted 4,000 of them. Coconuts and date palm, rosewood, some guava, and, you know, things like that, but mainly the mango and the, and the date palm. It's what they look like. I guess this is about four months ago. And I have another land next to it, which is the jungle, you know, like a virgin land, which is just really a natural forest. I collect all those seeds from there, some of those rosewood seeds. Very beautiful, but also kind of painful, you know, being in Cambodia, being, uh, you know, in this rural place, the trees, they die on their own or they cut down by villagers and, you know, it just kind of, uh, at first you're angry because you're like, man, people come into the land, they steal it. And then I realized, you know what, when people don't have, when people need to make a living, they do it. My job is to say to myself, hey, you're lucky. You have this land, you have these trees. People need to live. Don't be angry. Do what you can. Occupy the land, protect it as best you can. But make something out of it. Make art out of it. Make, you know, do something. Do something with it. And, and be, be acceptive, uh, you know, have acceptance of it. Bamboo from the land. I never knew bamboo can grow like that. So my staff keep bringing me all these things. I don't know. I said, this is very, uh, like, look at that. Bamboo grow like that? I've never seen it. 
So I make work that result from this, this feeling, this idea to use something, this, uh, this need to uh, balance you know, this, this, this sort of suffering, this sort of pain, and this, at the same time, this understanding and this sort of accept, acceptance that I am living in a third world, fourth world country, that there are people who are less fortunate than me. So make something, celebrate, celebrate what you uh, celebrate your ability and, uh, and get your mind to a better place. This one's called Mountain Spring. It's about, it's a little bit over four meters, about four and a half meters tall. And yeah, so some of that hardship can come into a work like Animal where, you know, I use a real uh, buffalo horn and real uh, cow horn, buffalo hide, cow hide, and the technique that I have, and these are a couple of, you know, the back hole and the excavator, as you can tell. So I want to give that idea that it's hard, it's, it's, it's tough developing a farm, making a living, you know, supporting your family with, you know, people working with no tools and, you know, not a lot of help and all that kind of stuff. You know, and at the same time, all these trees, and again, I, oh, I forget to mention, I also collect uh, these pots and pans. Uh, I go to the, to the detail a little bit here, uh, the process. These are all from the recycling place. Now these recycling places, they collect these things, they sell these things, and it goes to, mainly it goes to Vietnam. And it gets recycled and then, then they, they, come with, they come with new things to sell us. So we use it again and again. We don't really do recycling here in Cambodia. We sell it to people who, to, to countries like Thailand and, and Vietnam, our neighboring country who does this. So I thought, you know what, this is interesting. Take something that people use, collect them, and do something useful with them. Don't let them leave, you know, save the memory. So the result is this kind of work. This is my new work, it's not done yet. I, I feel obligated to show it to you because it, it, it means something to me now. During this time of COVID, we started uh, making this series of sculpture about, I think a year now, really about a year now. And, uh, the whole team is on it, and we have six trees going on right now. Uh, if, if this keynote was to take place uh, a month from now, I would have the complete sculpture for you. But just an example, this is one of them. So my reference I want to do is actually uh, make a, a constellation, uh, do a circle uh, to reference Matisse. This painting, this famous painting of Matisse called The Dance, uh, you know, which, which was influenced by William Blake, I believe. Um, but yeah, monochrome and against a blue background or a green background, to me it was a very, very seductive as a visual image and also, you know, the painting looking as an, my own interpretation is that it's like the spirits of the, the spirit of nature dancing, kind of losing themselves in the, in the, in the, in the atmosphere. And so, so that's my, that's sort of my way I want to go with this work. Um, that was the last slide of the talk. Um, I want to go into a bit, I think we still, do we have a little bit of time? I hope so. Um, yeah, lost yeah. You, can, you can talk a little bit more, yeah, thanks. Okay, fantastic. Um, so a lot of people ask me uh, early on, you know, when I give talks and stuff or when they write about my work, they assume that uh, Sophia Pick, he uh, designed something and then he, uh, you know, he worked with villagers and he worked with craftsmen and and he produced this work, you know, he, you know. I, I just want to say that it, it is through labor of, of, of my own. And I started with, with, with one assistant, you know, with, with the very first group of sculpture for about three years. Uh, and then the team grew. And uh, they are my relatives, not relative, like, well, they used to be blood relative, but they no longer work with me, but just young kids. Cutting the bamboo, this is a, the slide is a cutting bamboo from my neighbor. Later on, as the team grew and I've been making more and more work as the studio got bigger, we buy bamboo from a depot, which is on a Mekong River, which is 10 minutes from here walking from my studio now. Uh, my studio was at one point on the Mekong River itself and uh, we put bamboo in, uh, we bury it in the, in the water, we anchor it in this, you see those stumps, those bamboo stumps to kill the insects. 
All the preparation is done by us. Splitting the bamboo, boiling the bamboo, in this case, boiling the rattan, but it's the same tank. We build this tank ourselves. It's about four and a half meter long, just to accommodate. Usually bamboo we get is about four meter. Rattan we get is about three and a half meter. So, and it's boiling that, you see that Singapore can in the back there, that's a, that's a diesel oil diesel gasoline that we, uh, we just order from the next door, which is a gas station. So I'll just breeze through the, my staff. You know, we draw on the floor, you see the marking there, it's usually, you know, it's me drawing on the floor and then lining things up and working in the beginning with them and usually I let them figure things out and then when it comes to a certain point where I need to say, okay, stop, I have to look at it, then I look at it and change this, change that, and it's all very organic the way we work. You know, usually the drawings are on the floor. That's why you don't see many drawings. I don't do many drawings of my own sculpture because I don't know where the sculpture is gonna go. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I know where it starts, but usually I don't know where, it's, where it ends. Uh, sometimes it's clearer, sometimes it's not. This one happened to be a more of a clearer one, but. Maybe use metal for the first time for that seed pod. Wood, this is rain tree. It's the only tree that we buy to make sculpture because they are legal, because uh, there's a lot of rain tree in Cambodia and you can cut them down with no one saying you shouldn't do it. This is the last slide. Uh, this is me and my little corner. Um, well, pretty large corner, but yeah, that's the show. Um, Ian, you want to jump in? Yes, thank you. Uh, so, Pip, uh, it looks, it feels like we are drinking hot tea as we hear your talk. <laughs> um, I, I was, it's interesting that you talked about uh, Matisse and William Blake. Uh, I, you know, when you started talking about your work, I think on the 10th slide, I, I suddenly thought about this verse from William Blake's po point, having, mm -hmm. Heaven in a Wildflower. Mm. A and um, hold on a minute. The host has asked you to start your video. All right. Yeah. So this, 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 this text came to me when I saw your work and the way you describe it. Heaven in a wild, Wildflower. How do you fit a Heaven in a Wildflower? You obviously can't. And, you know, if you talk about scale, um, I'm thinking about how... Uh, the, the, the choice of um, the right size for, I wouldn't say maybe it's the right size because you talk about intuition a lot. Uh, and perhaps uh, the, the, the morning glory flower, the real size, and when you construct the sculpture, it is not really the morning glory anymore. I think it becomes something else, you know. Um, what is this something else, you know, I mean, we can talk about, I, can, I mean, I can think about the ideas about representation being sort of like put into a kind of metaphor in terms of uh, shape and pattern, yeah. Mm. Uh, can you say a little bit about uh, how this transformation takes place from the uh, original source of the real thing to something that is uh, highly uh, imaginary, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, I, uh, when people ask me, do you consider yourself an abstract artist or a realist? <laughs> I'm a realist, you know, I make real things, right? Now that real things uh, might not say anything to you like, in, you know, like what you normally see as real objects. And it's, that, that is where the, I believe the, the window of art happened, you know, for me, you know. You start off with something real, but you, but you push it to a degree where it becomes something else. It gives you something else. And that something else, I think, is, is, is this idea of, of central, of the center, like, you see, my work tend to be very complete and it, they, they, they tend to stand in a posture that is balanced and, and scale, scale will force you to confront that, you know. Uh, time, uh, to make something big is, is, requires a lot of time. The, the time to make something, I believe, or I fear maybe, that a lot of artists don't have the chance to 
to, 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 to throw themselves in, to give themselves. Or maybe it's not possible, right? Um, this, the time to labor through something, for me, that's always a kind of lesson for me. Because during the time of making, it's a time of focus. But it's not focus on life. It's a focus on, on the activity of, of life, right? And um, I'm not a Zen Buddhist, a Zen Buddhist or, or a practicing a religious person of any kind. But I think that, 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 that through labor, it shows me how something can, be, can become more than what it is that your original thing your original thought is of it. Right? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I think you used the word uh, you are a realist, which I think is really interesting because I'm thinking about the works that look like paintings. You know, you, you said that you are interested in paintings and you created this uh, set of two dimensional works. And actually, when I look at them and I compare them to the typical abstract paintings, uh, yours is like, they are like real objects, you know, they're not about pictures. They're not about a kind of illusion, you know. So when you say you are realist, I kind of like thought about this, these works, you know. Uh, although they, 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 they have a kind of formalism in terms of repetition and patterning and even printing, you know. Um, it's, not almost, it's, a, it's not really painting, actually it's almost like printing using the bamboo sticks. Uh, there is a kind of, uh, uh, there's a palimpsest that builds up. Yeah, I don't know whether is it from the a kind of lacquer you're putting on it, you know, but it, it, I see it like, like an object. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, I'm just, I'm just at the side of my eye. I'm looking at the box and I'm waiting for some questions to come in. Uh, and maybe I'll ask another question about, you know, your comment about, you know, your, your rattan work, you know, you have all these lines and they're all different, diverging very differently. Some, sometimes they split up into different, like wider sections. Sometimes they're very close together, together. And I'm thinking about how you talk about lines in relationship to uh, blood, the blood structures of the body. And I'm kind of reminded about uh, how a lot of artists sometimes when they start making drawings. Uh, I remember there was a slight presentation by Julian Schnabel, the, the American painter, and he started, one of his earliest work was just doing these lines and he says that oh it's it's connecting to bark the bark of the trees mm. so this relationship to like using the the pattern of nature uh, which for you is a kind of blood the idea of the blood system you know of the body and for schnabel was like the, the idea of the bark trees the patterns of how the these natural shapes are indeterminate they are not always uh, they are not the same all the time yeah mm. uh, i i think this is something that uh, uh, I'm reminded of when you talk about the, the way you practice uh, using the idea of lines as a way to form shapes, to form um, uh, uh, kind of constructs. Yeah. Do you want to comment a little bit about this? Yeah. Uh, well, a form is, simply put, a, a combination of lines, right? <laughs> lines, lines constructed together or put on together. The thing about the lines that I'm interested in are not the lines that comes out of me, if you understand. I, 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 want, I want to see, I want to recognize. I, I don't want to dictate like how a line becomes a line. I want to recognize a line and then find a way to, like you were saying, print, right? To, to, mm. to put that line onto a surface so that I'm not making the line with, a, with my pencil mark, with my pen. Like you never see me doing a, a, a complete work with a, with a pencil mark or, or, or ballpoint pen. Because to, to me, it's, um, I like the nature of the line itself. Like, like you'd have to maybe put a mic, microscope right on top of, uh, like if you draw with a pencil really strongly, and then you put, a, you put like a, 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 how do you say, a, 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 magnifying glass and you start to see all the breaking up of the lines, all the pencil, little shavings and markings, a little powder. Like to me, I'm interested more in, 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 in those things more than the fact that I made that mark. So, so like I show you the seashell. I think it was a, a clam or a scallop. I think it was a, a scallop shell. I think I collect that from France or Italy many, many years ago. It was just in my, 
my trove of, of just stuff. And um, so, so those lines are, uh, they, they, they are nature form, you know? The, the line in nature is not determined by man in a direct kind of man go there and make it look like that. The line in nature is, 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 is a composition of all these energy and, and, and time and, and, and forces of nature. Uh, and, 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 and the origin of that thing, you know, that, whether it be a tree or, 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 or a scallop shell. So I want, I want my work to be detached from me. This is why I have a kind of uncomfortable with this idea that people say, well, if you make art, you are, you're trying to express yourself. Okay, I guess if you want to be finite about it, yes, of course, you're an artist, you make art, you express yourself, but I want to, some, I don't know, I want to, I want to express something else that I, that I learned through the process of when I'm really trying to express myself. So I take myself, I want to take myself out of that equation as best as I can. I want, to, I want the imagination and the material to, to show me the way, right? So some sculptures just kind of go and go and go and go and then say, oh, here's where it ends. And that to me is like, it just makes my hair kind of stand up a little bit. Like that's a good day for me, you know what I mean? Like, if like, if like, I know you're a painter, Ian, so you know this. When the hair stand up, you go, yeah, this is good, you know? <laughs> and then tomorrow you're like, ah. <laughs> Yes, I, 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 like, I like what you talk about the, micros, the microscopic, you know, the, the, and it, I think it ties into the idea of the unknown and you are uh, always learning because you always say, wake up and do something. All right, I'm going to ask a question from the attendees. Uh, there's one from Jane Sim. Every aspect of your work seems labor intensive. Could you speak about what labor and discipline mean to you in your practice? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, uh, it's always been part of my life uh, because I, I think coming back, and that, and that has to do with environment, you know, like I come back to Cambodia when Cambodia was really, you know, trying to rise up from the ashes, you can say, 2002. Um, I know people who've been here a lot longer than that, and they tell me a lot more difficult stories about Cambodia, but, I, you know, 2002 was not a walk in the park, you know, and um, it still isn't, by the way. Um, it's a lot better now, but in 2002 was for someone who came back from, you know, Boston, Massachusetts, you know, landed in, you know, Phnom Penh, Cambodia. It was, man, it was just uh, emotional, you know? And um, so for me, working with, with just the, the, the need like, hey, get out of your head and really absorb the, the environment, you know, like people make a living by, by shoveling the road, by collecting trash, by collecting, you know, bottle caps and you know, farming and, you know, looting and, you know, that's, there's, there's just nothing pretty about it, right? And so, you know, I said to myself, if you want to be an artist, you better get off your ass and work because, you know, being idealistic about the universe is not really serve you, like it's not going to help you. So. So I just said to myself, like, look, just work, man. Just fucking work. Get, get, sorry. Um, I, I swear a lot. Um, and um, I think work will save you, you know, like at least it will not be, like you will not be living in some kind of prison, you know, uh, because there's a lot of bad stuff going on all around, right? There's the world, there's your family, there's, 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 there's your neighbors, there's, you know, a lot of chaos and work quiet all that chaos for the most part not all the time but for the most part so that's yeah i i, I just believe in it and, and you know this is the reason why i i have 15 staff you know because I, I just i just i just work you know thank you so peep i'm going to move to another question uh, from rafia ragino uh, natural element real objects and rawness seem like a kind of personal materialism to you or form of device a mnemonic device to remind you of your origin, Cambodia. And this play, uh, this play is, does this play an important function to you? Do you intentionally, uh, are you intentionally doing this? Uh, are you aware of the process or simply instinctive? Um, that's another good question. Look, I, I <laughs> like I've never been a sculptor, um, like, 
I have utterly no skill, I have no training tools of any kind. It's just something about this, this rattan and bamboo, it's like a magic, you know? It's like a, you pick up an oil paint for the first time, huh? you're an oil painter, right? It's just the way it moves on the canvas, it's just, it's so seductive. And you know every single moment you touch it, you work with it, it's just like it gives you, it just, it makes you happy, it makes you, happy is a shallow term to use, but you know, as you're making something, it's, it gives you richness, you know? So, did, did I claim it to be mine? Did I will it to be mine? Yeah, probably. I think so. I mean, if I don't have much to work with and I found something that I like to work with and it, 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 it produced these, these shapes that, I, that resonates with my inner being, well, there's, there's no need for me to run around giving it up, right? It's only like combining other things and then relating to other things. And, you know, since I work very slowly, other things come into the work very slowly. So if you look at the catalog of my work in the last 10, 15 years, you see I, I do have other things that I put in there, but I always rely on this, on this kind of a, a, a thing that, that gives me life. Thank you. Um, this another question from uh, Ramian Abdullah. I always like all your sculptures and admire the used nat uh, natural materials. My question is about acceptance of your own people, about the approach and style tend to be from the Western style and yet Cambo Cambodia has its own style in making art. Uh, yeah, so this is a question from uh, Ramian. That's great. Yeah, look, I questioned this for 15 years. I still don't know how to, how to answer it. I mean, I consider myself quite suspicious of culture. <laughs> I don't know who made this, this way, like, uh, this is the Cambodia, we should know, this is the Cambodia that we accept. Like, I just think there are gaps, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a big, in a big uh, box of, of, of culture, right? That, that, that Cambodian art is this, or Western art is that, you know, like, uh, I've grown quite of distrustful of that, of that notion. So, uh, as I said, tell you in the beginning that, that the lines is what, what draw me into a certain work of art, right? Uh, you know, looking at a Donald Judd didn't mean much to me when I was going to school, you know, because those weren't something that resonated with me, right? So I look at it from like, the, the Western part of me, you can say, or I can say, is that I learned that from being in school, you know, learning with, you know, my professors who, who have studied under people like Joseph Albers and, you know, uh, you know, some, you know, Ray Yoshida and, you know, some, some, some great artists, right? And, and you know, they, they actually say, so Pip, roll up your paper, go into the landscape, give me a drawing of the landscape. Don't come back until you have one, you know? And really forcing me to, to actually confront with the homework, right? Um, I think a lot of, a lot of time we, we don't really do homeworks anymore. Uh, I don't know, uh, art has become so conceptual nowadays and with videos and everything and performance. I came from a background where I learned how to draw from looking at nature. So that's what I come back here with. I do my best to communicate in some manner or other with my work. I wanted to, I wanted to, to really uh, make uh, the Cambodian people uh, get something from it. And so I make things that are that, that I think people can understand or at least be gravitating to. And then I also make things that I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm not in just in that little bubble. I also go a little bit further. So I, I let my imagination and my intuition bring me somewhere and I learn as I go along. I mean, really it's, you know, it's just making it up as we go along. So I guess uh, my next question is uh, from Jeffrey Say. I think it ties into what you just responded earlier on, but you may want to elaborate a bit on, on it. And also to the idea of the realist. So, hi, so Pip, it's interesting you call yourself a realist. Someone has referred to you as a formalist, as your works generally don't engage with social and political issues. Do you think that's a fair statement? Oh. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I don't know. Uh. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of pressure to say something like you're making art to, to express political leaning and, and stuff like that. I'm also very suspicious of politicians. Trust me, I, I don't really, I'm not a big fan of that stuff. I, 
if, if it does, it's only because I, it's inside of me somewhere and, and it just comes out, right? If, if people say the morning glory or the Buddha is about you know, the unraveling of culture or the destruction of Buddhism and things like that, listen, those, those things people can read into it and everybody wants to relate to it in a certain way. And, and that's great. I mean, I, I love that. You know, I want to see my work in that way where there are just so many way of getting at it and, and coming to it. And so I'm a realist in a way, like I'm a realist as an artist. I'm not a realist in terms of that life is a certain way only, you know. I'm a realist in terms of I take one step at a time. I make work that is based on something. It goes somewhere else. So, yeah, I don't know. Politics, I don't know. Okay, um, I think, thanks, uh, Sopit. I think um, uh, I just want to continue with my, my comment about the micro, the micro that you were talking about. I think that's uh, really interesting in the sense that you, you, you say you wake up and, and do something. And it's a lot of your work is almost like you learning about the world, which is still pretty much unknown to a, a lot of us. And I think you do that by, like, by constructing your objects, you know, by making your work to reach for a kind of resonance. You, know, you use that word a lot, a uh, kind of resonance. And you do it very slowly, almost like a kind of meditation. As you mentioned that you meditated before you came for this talk. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I've, I've, I see that that is a very important aspect of, of your practice. And to me, I don't really think about whether it's figuration or not. Although, yes, there are some aspects of it, but it's never clear cut. Uh, I always like to see art like a kind of, kind of axis, you know, from from something to nothing or from nothing to something, you know, it's never like uh, extreme to one, one, one situation. Yeah. Um, maybe I have one last question, which I think is quite, I find it's quite interesting about you. There was once, I think you, you talked about the, uh, the way you select bamboo. You go out to the forest, you cut the bamboo, when you select a specific kind of bamboo that works for your, the construction of, uh, of your work. Uh, and there's a kind of theory to it, you know. Uh, do you want to talk a bit about that? Oh, uh, well, uh, sure. Um, well, and, you know, the bamboo that I use is what is called uh, the Sai Srok, which is to say a farmer's bamboo. It's kind of grow in a farm. Um, it's not a bamboo you put into a pot or a bamboo that you necessarily make like a, a walk, a walking through garden, you know. Like, we don't have those... Uh, beautiful bamboo that you find in, uh, in Kyoto, you know, like in, uh, in Japan or in China. We have these clumps and uh, they're really tough, right? They, they're very prickly and, uh, you know, they're not easy to work with because they're really gnarly and, because, and, uh, you know, everyone is, all the bamboo is trying to grow to get the light at the same time. So, it's, so it grows differently and um, there's a lot of resistance to it. So, so the bamboo have a lot of character about it. That's very different from a, from a bamboo that just grow with spacing around them. Um, I use that bamboo because it's very strong, it's cheap enough, it's easy enough to find, and it's the most common when it comes to building, when it comes to anything, basketry, all those things, you, you, you use this bamboo. I also use other more particular bamboo, like the small, small, small yellow, golden yellow bamboo, which, is, which, which grows straight, but also but takes a long, long time to grow, it grows a lot slower. And uh, it's not as strong because it's very thin. So yeah, there's diff different, si different kind of qualities in the bamboo. The reason also that I enjoy actually going and cutting bamboo, and it's, we still do, you know, sometime I ran out of, or at least some ideas occurred to me and then I said, you know, this idea we need to go to the bamboo and we have to go to select the bamboo. So we still go out there and cut the bamboo and from cutting the bamboo, like just being there in, a, in, in, in the bamboo bushes in, a, in somebody's yard or, or backyard or whatever, you see how like the skin of the bamboo, there's some, there's a mark on it and, and stuff like that. So it, it just makes, just make me think like, oh, you know, if, if I didn't see that, I would never think about it. So just learn, you know, like that bamboo that twists and, 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 and swirls and I have many of those. It's just like the certain kind of bamboo do that, right? And, um, and when you go to the, to, the, to the forest or to the, to the place where the bamboo grow, you, you accumulate other knowledge that it's different than you just order bamboo and someone just ship it to your studio. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Sopip, for sharing your, your art practice um, and also uh, many insights uh, 
about the selection of materials, uh, your decisions, uh, and your opinions about uh, about uh, uh, the world. Uh, I want to thank you very much for your talk and for sharing this with us and to all the uh, sharing with us uh, and as well as to the students as well. So uh, we, we hope that one day when, uh, when the lockdown is uh, over, we can maybe invite you over to do something with us physically. So with that, thank you, Sopip, for your time and for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. So um, we have come to an end for, of this uh, symposium. And uh, I just want to, uh, we're going to have a bit of a wrap up. Uh, and I just want to t uh, shift this time over to uh, my senior lecturer, uh, Adeline Kui, uh, at for MA Fine Arts, uh, to say a few words. All right. So, Adeline, you want to take it away? All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Ian. All right. Um, looking back at the proceedings of today's symposium and where we are at in the midst of the pandemic, I would like to, on behalf of LaSalle College of the Arts, thank the keynote speakers, Claire and Sopip, the participants, attendees, and the organizing committee for allowing this space for the articulation of the liminal and invisible structures, processes, and practices. Perhaps it is because we are at this intersection of time, space, and cultural specificity that a kind of ethical critical vision a la Alia al Saji can begin to be imagined. Perhaps it is a vision that is more nuanced and one and poetic and one that guides our own research and practice as well as interventions. For that I am grateful for today and for the sense of hope that the symposium has facilitated and um, for the extended friendship and network that we've begun with this uh, journey. Thank you very much. And I'll hand it now to Ian before going, before we pass it on to uh, our organizing committee um, in Melbourne Uni. Thanks. Thanks, Adeline. Uh, thanks for the, for the wrap and to, to, to point us to the various signs that we have uh, encountered today. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say uh, a few thank you here, appreciation. So I just want to start by thanking the two speakers, yeah, uh, to the, to the, uh, today's keynote, uh, Claire Bishop and Sopip for their presentations, and also to all the students, uh, candidates who have uh, presented uh, their, their ideas and research. Uh, I also want to thank uh, our head of school, Chandra, for kind of like starting the ball rolling uh, with the early uh, conversations with BCA and LaSalle about having this symposium happen. And interestingly, this conversation we had just before the, the pandemic started. Yeah. Uh, and I'm so glad that we are now uh, actually making it happen. So I also want to thank the committee, which includes Danny Butt. Uh, early discussions about this symposium, or what should it be about? I think that it's great that uh, he agreed together with us that uh, a, a level of openness and uh, to experiment with a combination of completed and work in progress research. So this was important uh, in the kind of uh, providing with us a, to experience the thought process of all our candidates, whether it's a complete uh, work or a, a work that is still um, having its problems. Yeah, that needs to be unpacked. In a sense, having discussions about any research essentially uh, unravels new insights to continuity, change, and future developments. I would like to thank Kovas, uh, uh, Chloe Ho, and Alicia Buck uh, in working out the uh, information and coordinating with us on the on connecting virtually, uh, which was a challenge in terms of time differences uh, of participants from Singapore, Melbourne, USA, Cambodia, and England. Uh, we learned a lot from both of you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank also all the chairs involved, as well as Jeffrey Save uh, from uh, uh, MA Asian Art History for the inclusion of his alumnus. Finally, I would like to appreciate Adeline Kuei, MA Fine Arts Senior Lecturer, for getting our candidates ready for this event with the presentations and research profiles. She also worked very closely with Chloe and Elijah uh, on the groupings and themes of all our presenters. So thank you very much. So I just wanted to take, uh, uh, shift this time to uh, Chloe Ho and uh, Eli uh, Elijah. So thank you. Hi, 
Hi. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, we're, we're tuning in from campus today, right now. And can, okay, I'm just going to hold on to the, uh, that the thing, so you can go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we would just like to thank um, everyone who has been involved today. Um, the stu it was a great opportunity for all of the students, I think, from both um, schools to both see the kind of research that's going on and also exchange ideas um, and questions um, that arose out of all of the different presentations. So uh, it's also been a great opportunity for us um, to work uh, with LaSalle and McNally um, on this. It's been a really great opportunity for us as well. Um, and we've got a lot out of this uh, today and the whole process in general. Yeah, so um, just got a list of people to thank over here. Firstly, definitely, like, uh, I think that Adlin Kue and Ian Wu, they've put in a, quite a lot of work on this. Thank you so very much for, you know, like, uh, being so cooperative and, you know, with time differences. Basically, like, um, uh, Alicia and I were messaging them at 6 a.m. in the morning and, like, uh, you know, they were still replying us. So that's, like, pretty crazy. And so, yeah, thank you so very much for, uh, yeah, just being so responsive with, uh, uh, with everything. Um, so so maybe like, uh, yeah, so I'd like to thank uh, Danny Bird, uh, um, who has uh, Associate Director of Research from Victorian College of Arts, who has really been the one who was in initial contact uh, with LaSalle and setting this all up and then like getting us involved. So yeah, without without Danny, I don't think like uh, we will have this uh, symposium. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, you know, the uh, all the support we received from uh, the Kofa Graduate Academy fellows, especially Belinda Scary and uh, Madame Miriam LaRussa. If you guys are tuning in, thank you so very much um, for uh, kind of supporting us with, uh, on everything. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Simco, who is actually here in uh, the panelist room with us. Um, she has uh, been uh, very important uh, with uh, you know, all of the support and administrative support, tech support, and like general kind of like, um, well, everything support, like uh, I think uh, without her, uh, we would feel that we can't really finish doing this properly. Um, so yeah, it's been really good. Thank you so very much, Eleanor. Um, yeah, and then like, uh, I'd like to thank Brandon Liu, who is the one who's dealing with the Facebook live stream right now. And in, from the beginning, um, we had some tech issues in the beginning, but um, yeah, it's been great. Um, and also like to thank the rest of the uh, the organizing committee who's been involved in this. So like uh, we have Claville, uh, who's uh, in the MA Art Histories program from uh, at LaSalle. And uh, also I'd like to uh, thank uh, Chandra for um, also having been there right from the beginning actually. So yeah, thank you so very much, uh, you know, for really pushing us to do this, uh, this whole symposium. So. Yeah, that's all we have, and like, uh, so we also have. Uh, we are here on South Lawn. Um, it's, it's two weeks past lockdown, but it's kind of like our first time meeting up. So here we have uh, Genevieve Trail. Hello. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear her. Yeah. So um, yeah, she was also one of our student presenters today, and yeah, so we're just kind of like meeting up for the first time. Thanks very much, Thank guys. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.